This is Hannibal here from the HannibalTV.com. I'm with WWE, NWA, WCW legend, manager, general manager, referee. He's done it all. He's even wrestled a little bit here and there. The Godfather, Teddy Long. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm doing good, man. Uh, very, very good. Uh, I want to say one thing to you, too, just before we get started. Uh, a lot of the podcasts and a lot of the shows, you know, I don't do them. I refuse to do them because there are a lot of people that put stuff out there that I said I that say that I said something that I didn't say. So I do want you to know that, uh, uh, man, I see where you talk to a lot of good people, a lot of great people, and, you know, you seem real professional, and I'm just honored to be right here to be able to be on your show. Thank you. Well, we're honored to have you. We're glad we could set this up. The questions today are going to be mostly fan questions because I was bombarded with a lot of fan questions. So we're not necessarily going to go by a timeline. They'll kind of be all over the place. Okay, just whatever you want to do, man. Now, there is a guy, Johnny, asking right now if you're ever going to write an autobiography. Many people ask this, so let's start by answering this question. Uh, well, uh, let me say uh, uh, this to Johnny. What's going on with you, player? Uh, certainly, I thought about it. Uh, I thought, you know, when I came home this time, you know, I thought I was going to be able to kind of rest and, uh, you know, kind of work on a book, uh, as, as so to speak. But uh, I wasn't able to do that because, you know, I'm still active now. You know, people are still calling me. You know, in fact, I'm involved with a great organization uh, down in Texas, it's called SWE Fury. I'm the general manager there, and we're on a lot of TV stations. Hopefully, you know, we'll be coming on one out in, in the uh, Canada area. But uh, anyway, like I said, uh, if the day that I get ready to write that book or that autobiography will be the day that I'm just really done. There's no more going out, no more meeting and greeting, no more. It's just coming home and staying home with the wife and uh, enjoying the rest of my life. But right now, I'm still active, so I hadn't really thought about it, man, because in this business here, you know, things can happen that you never would have thought of happen. So I'm just going to keep on waiting because I may have something to happen to me that I might need to put in the book that, you know, if I wrote it too soon, I wouldn't be able to do that. So I think the more, the better stuff in the book, the better the book's going to sell. So hopefully I got some uh, more good stuff left in me and uh, a lot of good stuff's going to be happening and we can put that in the book and uh, we can make it a bestseller. Mike would like to know what your thoughts are on Kamala passing. I was luckily lucky enough to do an interview with him before he passed away, and I wrestled him before he was a great guy in my dealings. Well, I had the opportunity to meet him, too. Uh, what, what a nice guy. I mean, super nice guy. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, we lost a great one, you know, when we lost Kamala, one of the great guys, you know, that contributed a lot to our business. Uh, you know, like I said, man, you know, in this business here, you know, you have to kind of, you know, kind of take care of yourself, you know, and, uh, a lot of guys, you know, back in the day, you know, they just didn't get that. They didn't understand, you know, the importance of maybe eating right or, you know, uh, getting in the gym training and, you know, trying to look out for your body and your blood pressure. You know, a lot of people just wasn't aware of it. They didn't know it. I was one of those guys that didn't know it, but I was happy to start training because I was with a bunch, a couple of guys that were in, the, that were gym rats and that was Butch Reed and Ron Simmons. So by me start managing them, that had, they had me going to the gym. And after I started going, I kind of liked that on my own. So, you know, just, you know, you know, I think, you know, Kamala, you know, like I say, rest in peace. But, you know, that, and, and this is, a, a, a you know, something to let everybody else know, you know, as long as you're alive, you're able to take care of yourself. As long as you're alive, you're able to do the right thing for your body. So don't sit down and think just because I can't move around or I can't do this or that. There's no such thing. So please, it, it's never too late. Start trying to take care of yourself and uh, you'll see what I mean. You know, we're all going to go. We all got a day we're going to go, but I do believe that we can rush it. And I believe you rush it by not taking care of yourself, by not seeing about your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and everything else that has to do with the body. So, uh, you know, just take care of yourself, man. And uh, like I said, to Kamala's family and, and you know, for me and all the other know all the guys that knew him you know what a great guy and may he rest in peace now you mentioned doom the team of butch reed and ron simmons what was it like managing those two they're known as two of the legitimately most tough wrestlers ever well it was really you know a lot of fun you know and and uh i was also able to uh you know get myself over because you know i'm this little bitty guy 
you know, and I'm just out here running my mouth, talking all this smack, and these two big guys are standing behind me, you know, just ready to beat up anybody. So, you know, it was just great, you know, because, you know, I, I, you know, I talked to talk and they walked the walk. So it was just so much fun managing them, and they were so dominant in the ring. Uh, we had great matches uh, with uh, the Road Warriors, you know, and let's, you know, mention why well, since we're on that, you know, let's uh, say a rest in peace to uh, Joe Laurinaitis, uh, Animal, there. Uh, you know, just some real tragic to to see him pass away. And uh, I had been working closely uh, with him also. He was a part of our team in SWE Fury. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of great plans, you know, that we're going to, you know, we're going to do with him. And there was going to be like this uh, Road Warrior Tag Team Invitational Tournament that we were going to start. And he was going to be running that. But, but, but we are going to continue that. That is still going to happen. And, uh Next week, next Tuesday, the October the 14th, uh, next Wednesday, we will be there at the uh, Lava Cantino, and we will be doing a tribute to uh, Road Warrior Animal, a uh, big tribute to him, so we'll be talking more about that. And uh, like I said, uh, we worked with the Road Warriors. They had great matches with uh, Flair and on, you know, part of the Horsemen. Uh, they had great matches with the Rock and Roll Express, Midnight Express, I mean, Doom, you know, they were on fire. So it was just back in the day, it was a lot of fun, too. So we, you know, it was a great time for me, you know, managing those two guys. And I learned a lot, especially from Butch Reed. You know, he had the opportunity to be, in, you know, in a part of the business a lot longer than me. So that's how you survive in this business. You know, you learn and you learn, you know, how to play the game and you might hang around for a while. There was a few fans that wanted me to ask you if, Butch Reed's uh, personal demons were pretty much through by the time you started to get involved with him because he was known for, I guess that's why he was released by WWE, having having some issues that I know he's since overcome. Well, I, I don't think that uh, Butch Reed had any demons, anything like that. I mean, you know, back in the day, you know, everybody drank, you know, everybody drank alcohol, you know, and so, so, so that's the only problem that Butch had. He liked to drink, you know what I mean? And that wasn't just him. You know, me, I liked to drink then too. I was having a good time too. So I don't think any demons had nothing to do with it. You know, sometimes, you know, you can let something, you know, overtake you, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, I think maybe Butch may have, you know, may have drank too much, you know what I mean? So, you know, things like that happen, but I wouldn't consider them being no demons. He just liked to drink, but he's overcome all that now. And in fact, um, since you brought that up, Butch and Run, uh, October 24th, I think that's when we're doing it. But anyway, it's on the High Spots Network. We're going to be doing an auction there at uh, High Spots Network. And so you guys can look that up online, too, and you'll get a chance to see Butch Reed. Butch Reed will certainly be there with us. And it's not very often, you know, we get a chance that the whole team is together. So Butch and Run will be there at the High Spots Network. I believe it's on the 24th. But just go to High Spots Network and you'll see it on there. But uh, Butch and Run, great team. And as far as their matches with the Legion of Doom, as you just brought up, uh, what are your memories of that feud? Both of those teams were known to be very tough in real life and both had the uh, reputation of guys you didn't want to mess with. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. It was <laughs> Those guys were pretty tough. Um, I think we had a great story one time. I think we was in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I really believe it where it was. And I think they were working – they're working with the road warriors there. And uh, I think I did something. I may, I may have jumped up and caused a distraction or something. And I hit Paul Ellering with the key. I used to have this key and I hit Paul Ellering with the key. And this guy was sitting in the crowd there. I never forget that. And he was so mad at me till he jumped out of his seat. He grabs me. Now I think there's butcher run. They're trying to get this guy off of me. So then there's a big fight breaks out. But anyway, the police finally get there. They grab the guy. <laughs> and they take him in the back and the lock in the back. And then when he gets in the back, he's trying to explain himself. And the next thing I know, the police are, 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 are having to fight with him. He's trying to fight the police too. So that was, that was pretty hard for him. And they also feuded with uh, the skyscrapers off and on both incarnations of the skyscrapers. Any uh, memories of those teams? Well, yeah, uh, like I said, they were like I, basically the first tag team I had there, you know, uh, Sid Vicious and uh, Dangerous Dan Spivey, you know, what a great, you know, couple of guys. Uh, learned a lot from Dan Spivey, too. Uh, he was a guy that had a lot of knowledge about this business, learned, learned a lot of stuff with Sid. So great team. And uh, but like I think the problem. 
Oh, we may have lost him. Oh, you're back now. You're back. I'm back. Somebody was trying to call, so I declined it. All right. Um, yeah, getting back to Sid and uh, Danny, you know, another great team. Uh, had, you know, to manage them. I learned a lot with Danny and learned from Sid. And um, let's see, we had good matches, too. I'm trying to figure out, you know, like some of the guys that we worked with. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. We, we worked with this team one time in San Antonio, I believe is what it was, Dallas-Fort Worth. I, I can't remember the name, but there were a couple of guys that were just coming in to do jobs. And I remember, this is on uh, you, uh, YouTube, too. You can probably pull it up. Uh, and uh, this guy here didn't want to sell nothing. And I think Sid powerbombed him. He jumped right back up. Spivey clotheslined him. He jumped right back up. And, brother, they just looked at him. And the next thing I knew, they beat him to death. You know, I mean, it was like a death wish. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying? You know, guys, you, he knew better. You know what I mean? You know what this business is. You know what I mean? Just go out and do your job. But uh, it was great working with them. Uh, I wrote with Danny a little bit more than I did with Sid. So, me and Danny kind of traveled together for a while. And um, like I said, I, most of every team that I had, I really didn't have no really problem with. You know, I, I was able to get along with everybody. Are you surprised on how well The Undertaker ended up doing? I think he was... Me and Mark Callis when he started as the skyscrapers. Oh uh, yeah, um, I, I I managed him uh, in WCW too. He was uh, like you say, he was me and Mark Callis. So I had a chance to manage him. But uh, the way that I got it is uh, at the time I think his contract came up or something. He went in to talk to Ole Anderson and Ole Anderson and I think at the he was the Booker at that time. But the way that I got it, he went in to talk with Ole, and uh, Ole wasn't too fond of The Undertaker. You know, Ole said something about, you know, he would never draw any money or something like that, and he didn't have no talent. And Ole offered him some kind of ridiculous price or something that it just really was like peanuts. And so Taker refused it and uh, told him goodbye and uh, went straight on to New York. And uh, the next thing we know, uh, you know, we see here comes The Undertaker. So Vince McMahon knew what he had, but, you know, back in the day in this business, you know, a lot of times, you know, a lot of guys see and they know what you have. And just because sometimes they have the power, they'll do something that they know is wrong or that they shouldn't do. But they do it anyway because they got the power to do it. So they really missed it back there with, 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 with Taker because, like I said, you see what happened when he went straight to New York. He became the undertaker and he's still hot right up this day. You mentioned Danny Spivey and Sid uh, roughing up that guy that didn't want to sell. You've managed so many legitimately tough wrestlers. Who would you say is the toughest uh, of all the wrestlers that you managed? If you could have one guy to back you up. Oh, uh, wow. I had this guy that was uh, back in the day. A lot of people may not remember him, but he was Sergeant Craig Pittman. And, uh, I'm not sure what his rank was, but I think he had been in the army, or been in the in the service or somewhere. But he was tough. He was a he was the real deal. And I mean, he was so tough. And I I think and I I believe this is correct that Eric Bischoff had him to train his kid uh, to do. Yeah, Eric he, Eric's kid. He learned something from Craig, Craig Pittman, but he was a legit tough guy. Uh, I managed him, and uh, I tell you, Butch, Butch Reed and Ron Simmons were pretty tough too. You know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't take no stuff either. Those you didn't want to make them mad. You didn't want to piss them off. And uh, you know, I, I now I worked with another guy that I've had a chance to manage a little bit with Steve Doctor Dale William, which was another tough guy. And uh, so, like I said, Butch and Ron were pretty tough. Uh, 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 Spivey, yeah, he was another tough guy. So it was a lot of tough, a lot of, a lot of guys I managed, you know, back in the day. I mean, you had to be tough back then because I mean, when you stepped into the ring, you, you didn't, you didn't fool around. You worked. I think your wife might be in the same room as you, but there's a lot of fans that have asked, um, how were the uh, groupies back in the, uh, the old days of wrestling? Where was it as good for the managers and referees as it was the wrestlers? Uh, well. Not, not really as good for the managers or or the referees or it was for the boys, you know, because the boys were kind of the guys that were always in the spotlight. But the managers, you know, got a chance, you know, to be, you know, to be all right too, because there was always somebody that liked the manager, you know, so so the manager wasn't left out. 
So, like I said, back then, you know, back in the day, man, it was great. You know, guys would have uh, the, a lot of groupers, you know, they, you know, you didn't have to worry about renting no cars or nothing because they'd show up uh, way back when we used to be at the old TVS studios, you know, they had the girls that would pick the guys up from the airport and bring them to the studio and wait there on them and then pick them up, take them back to the airport or either take them to the hotel or drive them around or anything they had to do. So you didn't have to worry about no rental cars or and then some guys were lucky enough that the girls paid for their rooms and stuff. Already had their hotel rooms and stuff laid out for them. So uh, it, it, it was for the for the wrestlers. It was a pretty it was pretty good for some wrestlers. Now I understand you had to go to wrestlers' court twice backstage in WWE. What is that for people that don't know? And is it true you were brought to that? <laughs> yeah. Uh... Wrestler's court was uh, where, well, you know, when you, you kind of did wrong, you know, they'd have to, you know, rectify you. So Undertaker was the judge. And uh, so they, they, they took me to wrestler's court twice. And the first time they took me to wrestler's court is because I was selling uh, Viagra to the boys. So uh, I, they, they were going to, you know, try and, you know, give me this big sentence about the Viagra. So I didn't have no lawyers. So. I ended up having to get May Young, God rest her soul. May Young was my lawyer. And so when I took May Young in there with me to wrestler's court to defend me, we almost had my case won. And May Young yells out and she says Niagara instead of Viagra. So that was a description right there. So that's how I lost my case. And so I ended up having to buy a bunch of beer and a bunch of food and stuff you know that was part of my sentence but uh wrestler's court was was pretty good uh i just enjoy watching other people but they got me twice i'm gonna guess they don't do that as much anymore because every year things seem to get more and more corporate back there yeah you know a lot of stuff is left out you know we used to do a lot of stuff you know we used to have a lot of fun you know backstage sometimes we had more fun backstage than we did when we went out to perform in front of the live audience because you know everybody was happy you know everybody you know everybody's involved in something and whatever you were involved in it was getting over it was good on tv and you went out you got a tremendous pop or they liked you they cheered you they hated you they booed you I mean, you got that you know you got what you were and uh so it was just great to, you know to be working it was the attitude every day so it was great to be working back then so we just used to have a lot of fun backstage we used to do a lot of stuff and uh just to you know pull pranks but uh like i said we like you said it's kind of more corporate now and uh you don't really have any guys that really you know the, the i think the, the morale is a little bit different now than it was back then so you just don't have too much going on there's a fan on here that wants to know what it was like on the road with JBL and Ron Simmons when you traveled with them. Oh, which, uh, absolutely great to uh, ride with Ron and John. Uh, I, I love that because they knew I was cheap, so I really never had to really pay for that. You know, I attempt to pay, but, you know, like, we, you know, we get to this tow boot. And I'd be reaching, you know, like I'm looking for the money, but I know you can't just stand there at the tow booth, you know, you can't hold up all the traffic. So I just stall around until somebody in the car paid, you know, because I know we had to go on through the booth. So then I told them I'd just catch them, you know, later, I'd give it to them. So, but they did a lot of stuff to me too, you know, so, but they, they were fun. It was great. And I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people heard the story about the time I left run in the snow. Uh, we uh we had Godfather, it was me, Godfather, JBL, uh, Ron. We were all in the car, and uh, we're on our way to Albany, New York. So it starts snowing, man. I mean, it's coming down. So we end up getting a case of beer, you know, because that was a ride back in the day. You know, you get a case of beer and hit the road. And uh, so, you know, once you, you know, start drinking beer, you know, everybody got to, you know, go to the john. And so, you know, a lot of times you couldn't wait to find the bathroom because, you know, up there around New York, you know, the exits are so far apart. So I pull over to the side so everybody gets out, you know, and use the bathroom. It's kind of dark, like it's really not day, so you can kind of get away with it. So everybody, I got out, everybody got back, I got back in the car, I was driving. So, you know, I wasn't really paying much attention. I thought everybody was in the car. So uh, I see, I think Godfather made, no, J John, he, JBL, he was the last one. He got in the car, so he gets in the car. 
Oh, I shut the door and I drive off. So he looks at me and asks me, what am I doing? I said, we're going to New York. What are you talking about? Then he tells me that I left run back then in the snow. So there's, I couldn't find no exit. So I had went almost a half a mile. So I had to get back on the shoulder and I had to bag all the way up at least a half a mile to go back to pick him up. And uh, when I did get back there, he was just like a snowman. He's covered in snow. And he said to me, damn. And that was before that he ever starts using the word damn on TV. But he said, damn, long. <laughs> that was his words. And as far as JBL's, uh, the rumors out there that he was a backstage bully, did you witness any of that? Obviously, it was usually directed at the young wrestlers, so I don't think he would have tried anything with you. Who? Oh, what? I didn't get that question. Oh, like, what is your opinion on uh, the rumors out there of, of the people that say that uh, JBL used to like to bully the younger wrestlers, did you ever witness any of that? Uh, JBL was never, that, 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 that's not true. He didn't never bully anybody. You know what I mean? John was just a, a, a funny guy. He just liked to have a lot of fun. And sometimes, you know, maybe he might rub you the wrong way or he might say something, you know, that some people take it a different way. But John, I mean, God, you couldn't find a nicer guy, man. So I don't think it was no bullying there. Some people took it that way, you know what I mean? And just said, well, you know, I know this guy's so big, you know, he's just bullying me, making me, you know, just talking to me any kind of way. But there were a lot of guys, you know, that you talked to any kind of way that kind of needed that, you know what I mean? Because they come into our business and they just, you know, want to take over and just, you know, do whatever they wanted to do. And it didn't work like that. You know, everybody there, you know, they paid their dues. People worked hard to try to make it to the top and to get where they were. And then you got some guy walking the door and think it's just going to be, you know, you just going to spread over everybody. So it's, it's a little bit of, you know, it's what we call respect. And that's on any job. That's on you too, Devin. I mean, you say some guy just came on your show and completely took over, just disrespected you. You wouldn't put up with that. So it's just a lot of things, you know, a lot of people, they get mad because they can't have it their way or they didn't have it their way. And then they want to say the guy was a bully and all that. But I never seen him bully anybody. All I seen him stand up and just talk to people pretty rough. But he talked to me rough. We didn't care. I mean, we, we was all joking. It was all in fun. And they they inducted you into the Hall of Fame, didn't they? What did that mean to you? Uh, that was really a big surprise because I never uh, – would have thought anything like that. I didn't, you know what I mean? I mean, I was proud of what I did. I was proud of my work, but, you know, I never did really think about going in the Hall of Fame because I always looked at that as, uh, you know, that was for wrestlers, you know, guys that put their bodies on the line every night. And, uh, you know, I just never even thought about it. So when that, that they called me with that one, that was, uh, that was really big. That was re really a big surprise. So, uh, you know, at least, you know, it showed me that somebody appreciated uh, what I did. And uh, I think that's what a lot of guys need, too. You know what I mean? Sometimes I mean, they always got to be the Hall of Fame. You know, sometimes you can just be told, you know, you've done a good job or something. But to uh, make it to the Hall of Fame and get that uh, prestigious, uh, you know, laid upon you. I mean, I, I, I you know, it's one of the greatest things that happened to me and, you know, I went all the way back to, you know, when I started and broke in and, you know, all the ups and downs and, you know, and stuff, you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, somebody, you know, felt I deserved it. And uh, and that was the McMahons, and I thank them very much. Neo GX1 is asking uh, if you could share your thoughts on the Benoit tragedy and did you ever get the chance to meet Nancy? Uh, well, you know, I... I was right there pretty pretty much close to that. Uh, Nancy, you know, when I broke in the wrestling business, I broke in under uh, a guy named Kevin Sullivan. And uh, Kevin Sullivan was married to Nancy. Kevin and Su uh, Nancy were married. And so I rode with them. And I knew Nancy, you know, way before I even knew uh, Chris Benoit. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, that was just this thing that they started this little angle at TV that they were going to do, uh, which... Uh, would have ended up, I think there was somewhere Nancy was supposed to be involved with Benoit and Kevin was supposed to find out about it and then it was supposed to turn into a big match or something and they were going to have it at a, at a big pay-per-view. So, uh, like I said, I don't know what happened, uh, what went wrong, but all I know is that uh, 
after a while, then Kevin and Nancy were split up, and uh, then there was uh, uh, Chris and Nancy. So then I had a chance to, you know, you know, ride with them when doing that whole little segment too. So uh, just two great people, Nancy especially. She, I knew her from day one, man. When, like I said, I first broke in, she was married to Kevin. And she was woman. She man managed a lot of guys too. And uh, she was also down in Florida with Kevin Sullivan in uh, the dungeon. And um, like I said, my wife had a chance to, you know, we, we weren't even married at the time, you know, but my wife had a chance to ride with me and she had a chance to meet Nancy too. So they were really real close too. So she knew her too. So, uh, you know, just, just a real tragic loss for, on both of them because I knew Chris too. Chris was, incredible nice man golly he would give you the shirt off his back so we lost two two great people there and the kid as well unfortunately but i'm sure you didn't know the kid that well as far as kevin sullivan i've done a lot of interviews with him he appears on this channel a lot do you have any stories about kevin you could share with us um <laughs> let's see jesus i don't know man I understand oh, you wow. like to smoke weed, from what I understand. Or at, uh, one point, at one point, didn't you guys both like smoking weed here and there? Oh well, yeah, we did that. Well, I like doing that now, so it's no big deal. Uh, yeah, we did that. Oh, I know, I know. Here's a good story. Uh, where were we at? We were in uh, Amarillo, Texas. I believe it might have been Amarillo, and so we was in this hotel room, and so. Uh, we're smoking in this hotel room and so the scent went out and i guess somebody smelled it and so some the people smell it then i guess they called the front desk so the front desk called the police so the police come upstairs man and they checking out it but well i think all we have was a journey something we smoked it up we didn't have nothing else so they come in looking for stuff and so i had this stuff they used to call call magic shave it was like a paste you could you know mix it up in water and make a powder out of it and that's how I used to shave. And, uh, but it stinks so bad, man. It was the stinkiest stuff you could ever smell, but it's called magic shave. And so what I did, they were going to lock us up. And so what I did, I went and got the magic shave and I mixed up some in this cup. And I told the guy, the police, and I showed it to him. And I said, take this. I said, this is what they smell. And you could smell it. It was all over the room. And he smelled that. And they told me, he said, oh, okay. And so they let us go, man. They didn't. They, they thought they were smelling, thought the scent that they called about was the magic shade. And Dorian wants to know if you have any good memories of being in the city of Baltimore. I know that was a big NWA, WCW town back in the day. Uh, yeah, the greatest memory I had there is uh, with the Jim Crockett Cup. I was able to be a part of that. And uh, I remember I had a chance to, uh, you know, at, at the Magnum TA had the car accident and everything. I was there to, you know, to walk him uh, down to the ring and be a part of the Jim Crockett Cup. So that, that's one of my big fond memories of Baltimore, Maryland. There's been a few fans on here that uh, want to know your Dusty Rhodes story. That I'm not really familiar with it, but apparently you have some Dusty Rhodes story. Well, I I don't know any, any story he's talking about. The only thing is uh, uh, Dusty, God rest his soul, too. He was one of the people that gave me uh, my first job. So the uh, only thing I can good story I can tell you about him is uh, uh, when I was uh, first started breaking into business, when I was uh, refereeing and uh, just hanging out at the TV station, you know, just getting jackets, uh, I used to run errands too, so I'd go and get uh, lunch and stuff, uh, you know, like the production people, like Jim Crockett, uh, J.J. Uh, Dillon, he was one of the uh, agents and uh, all the people that were in the production. And so Dusty would bring me in there and before I could get their order or something, you know, either I would go and get everything and bring it back and be he wouldn't let me leave. He would make me sit down in there and just wait, you know, in, in case, you know, somebody else wanted something, I wouldn't have to come back. But I, you know, I always took it like that. But, you know, I finally found out after I stayed in this business so long, you know, till I, uh, you know, he was really training me, you know, he was learning me. And I, you know, because after I started working for a while, then I started remembering some of that stuff that I heard in that room that they were talking about. And then that's, then all, everything started making sense to me. So that how, that's how I was really able to really 
develop my own character and stuff because I, I finally figured out, okay, I know what this is. Now, you already mentioned this, but Bill just tipped me $25, and he's wondering if you have any other stories you could share about Ron Simmons and JBL. Uh, <laughs> no, not, not, uh, oh, okay. I think one night, let's see, whoa, 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 it may have been Albany, Georgia. No, not Albany, Georgia. We was in Albany, New York again. Uh, and that's when, uh, you know, Ron and John, they were doing the APA. And, uh, so I think we were in this bar, I believe it was a holiday inn. I believe we were in this bar and, uh, you know, John and Ron, you know, they're being they doing their usual, you know, it wasn't no APA, you know, they just like to drink at the time, you know, they drank. So they were drinking, I was sitting there, you know, and so we were drinking, eating. So some guy comes over and he sees him. And so he starts wanting to buy him drinks, you know what I mean? And he he, he really uh, challenged John. He told John that he could out drink him, you know, I could out drink, I could drink way more tequila than you and something. So uh, that was uh, pretty bad. He shouldn't have never done that. So he ended up buying all these drinks, man. And so they drank him right under the table. And uh, he drank so much till he passed out. And he had his girlfriend with him. And so some guy that was sitting over at another table just came over, took the guy's girlfriend, took her on with him. And this guy was passed out, was sitting there trying to out drink John and Ron. Now, there's a story that I'm sure, while well, you said it, it's all over the internet of, of Ric Flair allegedly, allegedly calling you the N-word. Uh, this forever tired 2000 is wondering if he ever apologized for that. Uh, no, no, no I, no, I don't think, I mean, I mean, if he had, I would know. No, he hasn't, but I, here's the thing about that. You know what I mean? Sometimes people don't apologize, like come up to you and say, I apologize. You know, sometimes, you know, they, you can, you know, they can speak to you, uh, maybe try and hold a conversation with you to let you know in so many words, you know, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm sorry about that. But like I said, I ain't never really expected that. And I really don't, don't, don't really care because I put that all behind me. Uh, I was able to make it and I was able to show people, you know, that, you know, had that negative about me and said that I would never make it and I had no talent. I was able to prove them wrong. So that that was good enough for me. So I don't need no apologies, you know what I mean? But like I said, I'm just telling the truth. It is what it is. That's what happened. What is the story behind that for those that don't know? I've only I've only heard people say that he allegedly called you that, uh, but I've never actually heard the story uh, myself. Well, uh, it's like one time in Knoxville, Tennessee, I think, and uh, I never remember there were some girls that were trying to come into the back door, uh, getting in the back of the arena. And then I think he was maybe at that door and they said some girls threw me on the bus. I don't even know who they were. I'm referee. I don't know these people. And uh, they said, that used my name and said that I told them that they could come in or I could, they could come to the back door or something like that. And so he runs into me and the next thing I hear him say, says to me, uh, Ian, do you like working here? I guess That's in the old was. days, uh, it was maybe more common. I'm not saying that that's right at all, but I've heard Tony Atlas, uh, say in interviews with me that, uh, it wouldn't be that uncommon to hear that word in the dressing room um, in the 80s. Is that is that correct? Or Well, yeah, that's pretty much correct. But, you know, it, you know, my, my thing was like this. You know what I mean? You're going to hear a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? So just say what I learned to do be, do it this way. You say what you want to say. Just don't put your hands on me. That's when you got a problem. So, you, could, you know, like I said, I'm, I got so used to hearing that too. You know what I mean? I ain't. And a lot of times, a lot of people say it to, to, to use it to try and get you to defy yourself. And that's what a lot of guys didn't understand either. They couldn't take it, you know what I mean? When they heard it, they just went, you know, off. Oh, but that was a trick, you know what I mean? They'll get you, you know, where they, you know, like, well, you can't come in here fighting and stuff, so you, you, you're fired. But you actually fired yourself because you let it get to you. You didn't know how to play the game. 
Yeah, there's a lot of backstage politics for the people that have never been in wrestling, that don't know about it. But it's a lot like high school back there. Uh, maybe not so much today, but probably today. Um, but it was really bad in the eighties. Well, yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I was, I was part of that. You know what I mean? I, like I said, uh, I was just completely blessed uh, to be able to, you know, survive all the negative part of it. You know, and I was coming up for as referee and managing, and then, uh, like I said, I never will forget, man. Uh, uh, Gene, Gene Oakland, God rest his soul, and uh, Bobby Heenan, another man, God rest his soul. They came into WCW when uh, a lot of guys had left WWE, uh, left New York and came down to WCW. And they stopped me in the hall one day. I think it was where we were. I'm not sure. But they told me to my face, they said, if Vince McMahon knew what you could do, he would blow you up. And uh, those, that's, 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 that those were those were, that's what those two guys told me. And uh, I never did forget that. And when I finally made it to New York in 1998, I finally went there. And then especially after I went through the refereeing and the managing, and then I was, you know, God bless me. And I was able to land the job of general manager. And that really mean, meant that I had to get out there and I, you know, I had to, you know, do my thing. And uh, to be able to, you know, show him and prove to him that I could be what he wanted me to be out there. Because like I said, when I started working for him, I found out that this was strictly business. This is about money. You don't play with this. You know what I mean? You know, this is billion dollars here. So when you go out on that TV, you're out there for a reason. And uh, you also got to learn when you walk out on that TV, don't go out there, go in business for yourself. You go remember who you are, remember what your role is, know what you're supposed to do. And I learned all that. And that's, you know, in fact, I, I Vince made a better person out of me because in WCW, you know, I had a chance to slack a lot because people wouldn't tell me when I was doing wrong. So my basically training was on the job training. So, uh, like I said, it's just, you know, just I'm just glad, you know, to be, you know, to be able to make it. Jordan is wondering what your all-time biggest payday was. Maybe you don't want to tell us the amount, but maybe you could tell us uh, what match or pay-per-view that may have been for. Uh, I think the biggest payday I got one time, I don't remember what day it was, but it was a royalty check I got. I, back, I think I was on the 2007, 2008 uh, a video game, uh, SmackDown. Uh, versus Raw, I believe uh, that was the game, but that uh, I was on that video game, so I got this check. I think it was about eighty thousand dollars, and I uh, <laughs> off a video game. So that was uh, the biggest payday I got. Yeah, those are some of the nice benefits of working for WWE, getting those checks in the mail. Well, not- back you know, well back then, you know, in the attitude era, everything was good. I mean, you know, you know, every, the arenas, you know, were packed. Uh, everything, the everything was selling out. Pay per views were packed. Uh, merchandise was selling. You know, action figures. You know, anything that you were involved in, you know, you was able to make money. So, you know, business was good. You know, you know, because there were people there that were, you know, putting them in the seats. You had The Rock. You know, Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know, uh, you know, Triple H, John Michaels. Uh, you know, a lot of great talent there, Kane, Undertaker, uh, people, you know, I mean, that, you know, knew their job. And when they went out there, they entertained you and they made people, you know, want to come see them. And that's what it's all about. You know what I mean? You entertain them, make the people want to come see you. And so I learned that part, too. So, uh, you know, I was able to, you know, have a good run with that. You know, people enjoy watching me come out and work. And, I, and when I found out they enjoyed it, then I entertained them. Rassler wants to know what was it like managing Rodney Mack? I don't think Rodney Mack ever reached his full potential. Uh, well, with Rodney, it was real great. Uh, we had a, I, That's when I first started managing. I was a heel, and uh, we was doing the thing called the White Boy Challenge. And uh, that, that, that was really great. And uh, Vince McMahon was the author that he wrote that. That was his stuff. And uh, so I was able to go out and pull that off. And uh, so managing Rodney was great. Rodney was what a great worker. But like you said, he never did reach it either. But, you know, then, uh, you know, Rodney, you know, he got hurt uh, a couple of times and that kind of slowed him down a little bit. You know what I mean? Injuries can kind of give you a setback. 
And so uh, I think some of his injuries, you know, kind of set him back a little bit. And so, you know, in this business here, you know, trying to play catch up, uh, that's really rough. And uh, him being married to Jazz and then, you know, they, they, you know, got family, you know, and so they, you know, they, you know, they're trying to raise their kids and stuff. So, you know, this, you know, a lot of pressure out there, but, uh, you know, but what I am doing now, I'm happy to, you know, you know, to be able to work with both of them. And like I said, I'm in this company, it's called SWE Fury. I'm the general manager there. And uh, Rodney Mack is part of a tag team with us. It's called uh, Perfect Enemy. And uh, Jazz, uh, we got, we've got we also retired her. And uh, we're going to put her in the SWE Hall of Fame. And Jazz is going to be also helping us backstage. She, I want her to become an agent and start helping with the ladies, with the girls' matches. And make sure that the uh, girls know what they're doing out there. And then we're also getting to start a school uh, dojo camp, SW Fury camp, uh, you know, kids, you know, guys that want to get involved in professional wrestling and get trained and jazz will be one of the trainers in there. So her and Rodney also. So, cause Rodney, I think he's about ready to try to, you know, let it, you know, hang it up and just sit back and try to, you know, train guys and just give back, you know, and try to help the young kids and try to help them make it. Bill was nice enough to give me a $50 tip and he wants to know, what your favorite role in wrestling was not not uh, paying attention to money did you prefer being a referee manager or gm well i preferred being you know the gm because with the gm you know what i mean i had a just not only did that role you know you know make entertain the people it helped me i learned a lot because you had to learn a lot when you walked out on the tv and you stayed out there as much as i did you know, you had to be, you know, you had to learn, you know, how to keep that audience, you know, how to keep people where they're not tired of looking at you, not tired of seeing you, either when they do see you, they're ready to see you, you know, okay, well, here's Teddy Long, now we're going to get this straight now. And so being, you know, being with Vince and following his orders, because he knew when to put me out there and when not to put me out there. So, you know, it's just, you know, and I learned all that too, you know, and that's some stuff now that I can share with these guys that I'm working with, you know, I know when it's too much and I, and I know when it's not enough. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff you have to learn. So like I said, I, I really enjoyed being a general manager because you're at the top of the line. Then that's just, that's just like wearing the title, just like being the world champion. So, you know, you learn, if you don't learn it there, you ain't gonna never get it. And to show you that I learned it, I was in that spot for nine years. And you were in the ring when the unfortunate incident happened where I guess something happened where D'Lo Brown ended up paralyzing draws due to some type of mishap. What was your reaction to that? And did you know it was as serious as it ended up being paralyzing him at the time? Well, at the time, you know, it uh, it was really frightening to me, too, because that was the first time, you know, I'd ever been in the ring with something, you know, that, that terrifying to happen. Uh, what I think is uh, they were both sweaty there. And then a lot of times, you know, when guys got ready to go to the ring, a lot of times guys put on body oil, you know what I mean? They, you know, put oil on the body. So the only thing I can remember there, you know, I remember D'Lo picking draws up, you know, as to set him up for maybe like a power driver. And uh, as he went to pick him up, I, I just, you know, only thing I can say, I think Dito, he slipped. Uh, like I said, they, like guys have oil on their hands or something, you know, and just sometimes maybe too much oil. But anyway, I think, you know, Dilo dropped him or he slipped. And when he did drop him, he dropped him straight on his head. And it was like a spike, you know, he like spiked his head. And I never forget, I was over talking to him and, he was saying to me, you know what I mean? He couldn't hardly breathe, you know, he couldn't get his breath much, you know, and he just kept, you know, saying he felt like he was going to die, you know, and he kept saying stuff. And that was the first time that happened, you know, in, in, in my career too. So I'm giving a signal, you know, trying to let everybody know that, you know, what's going down in there. And so that was, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty rough night. Yeah, that's pretty bad. Do you think they throw up the X? almost too freely now it seems like well, every show or every second show we're seeing it up well i think you know they're doing the right thing now you know what i mean because you know back in the day you know guys you know this this, this was in your blood you know what i mean and when you were out there performing you know and sometimes you could get hurt and you know you still didn't want to stop 
And I'll tell you a little bit of story. You know, one time I remember Jazz, she blew her shoulder out. And right in the match, she blew it right out. And, brother, we didn't, you know, we, she didn't want to stop. And I walked right over to her. You know, I was managing her at the time. And I walked right over to her. And on the side of the apron right there, she was on the outside. And I just grabbed her arm. And I just snatched it. And I snatched her shoulder. I pulled it right back in. Just the luck of the draw. I, you know, that's all I can say. And Jazz stepped right back in, went right back to back to wrestling. So, um, like I said, right now, you know, you can't take any chances. So anybody, any sign of, of, of somebody getting hurt, they throw it up right away because, you know, you can't let a guy continue to go on. He may have a concussion. Uh, you know, something could be wrong. All you, all you know is what you see on the outside. We don't know what's going on in the inside. So. I, I agree with them. If somebody gets hurt, they need to throw that sign up right away and get, you know, in fact, make the guy stop and, you know, get him out of there. There's been a few fans on here that have wanted to know how your dealings were with CM Punk. Uh, I had a great relationship with CM Punk. Uh, CM Punk is one of the people now, there are a few people that around Christmas time I have a chance to call and wish a Merry Christmas and also a lot of other holidays. Uh, I had a great relationship with Punk. I love Punk. Uh, I never forget, um, you know, I, I stay in the gym. I do a lot of cardio. And I remember one time we was overseas, and uh, he bet me $100 that I couldn't do two hours of cardio. So I did this one hour. So I got off and, you know, went to the bathroom, relieved myself, and jumped back on and did the other hour. So after that, you know, we really got tight. And I never will forget one time me and him was in uh, Laredo, Texas. And we were running in, you know, jogging in the street, man. It was, I knew it had to be 120 degrees. It was just crazy, man. I, that's the first time I did that, though. But I had to hang there with him. But I had a great relationship with CM Punk. He was a great guy, man. Bill tipped me another $75. He's a big fan. He wants to know if you have any stories about Paulie Dangerously. Uh, no, not really. You know what I mean? I saw him, you know, you know, back in the day when he was uh, managing, I think, the Samoan SWAT team, maybe, I think, maybe back in the day. Uh, then he, I think one time he was, he, he used to ride with, he, he was good friends with Kevin Sullivan, too. And so he was back there riding with, with us. And so I think what they would used to do to Paul is every time they get mad with Paul or they want to annoy him, uh, Kevin had a kid named Ben, and uh, Ben would boy, he could he could really get on your nerves. And so, whenever they want to punish Paul, they would take Ben and they would load Ben up with candy, and they would put Ben in the car with Paul, and Ben would just jump all over him all the whole drive. He's all on his neck. He's just driving him nuts. So that's that's the only basic story I know about Paul. Now I understand you witnessed a situation where. Steve Blackman took down the big show in the dressing room. Could you share that story with us? Uh, Steve Blackman was uh, laying down on the floor and uh, just minding his own business. And I think big show stopped over and he stopped in front of him or something. And I don't know, might've been some words said. I, don't, I mean, I wouldn't argue him, nothing like that. But anyway, I think big show went to do something and Steve Blackman took both his legs and he hooks big show right there, standing there and big show couldn't move. And, and uh, Blackman never got up off of his back. How do you think Blackman would have done in the brawl for all? He got injured against Mark Miro but dominated that fight. And he seemed to me like he probably would have been the guy to win it if he hadn't been injured. Do you think he could have possibly taken out Bart Gunn if they had fought in the brawl for all? Well, um, that's another one that would you would really, you know, like we say in the, in the back in the day, it's too close to call because now you got Bart Gunn there. And Bart was tough. Better believe me, Bart was tough. And so was Steve Blackman. So, you know, this one here, you know, you don't even want to bet on. You don't even want to put no money on, man, because you got two guys here. That, I mean, they're they going down with the ship. But, you know, I don't know. I just don't know, you know. I mean, Blackman may, might have been able to pull it out because I'm, I'm, maybe to me Blackman may have been a little bit more quicker on his feet than Bart. But you, you'd have to be pretty quick because that, that Bart gun was tough. It seemed that, like Blackman may have been more well-rounded, but we'll never know, I guess. Marco says he really enjoyed you managing Doom. 
and he wants to know if you heard anything about Hacksaw Butch Reed lately, how he's doing. By the way, Marco, I did an interview with him last year. You could check that out, but Teddy probably has a closer update for it. Um, well, yeah, I, I, uh, we, I, we talked to Butch, and like I said, I may have mentioned to you earlier, uh, October the 24th, I think that's when it's going to be. But anyway, you can go to the website. It's called High Spots, uh, highspots.com. Go to that website, and uh, we're doing an auction. It's going to be me, Butch Reed, and Ron Simmons, uh, like a Doom reunion. And so we're going to be doing an auction plus signing autographs, and we'll be doing some live stuff. So, yeah, I, we stay in touch with Butch, and uh, Butch is doing well. Everybody's alive, and everybody's trying to stay safe. And, uh, you know, we just hanging in here, player. There's a few people that wanted me to ask you, what are your thoughts on Tessa Blanchard? And do you see her ending up in AEW or, or WWE? There seems to be a bit of a void in WWE right now with, with some of the ladies out. Well, um, I had a chance to meet a, a, a real nice girl, man, and a great worker, you know what I mean? And like I said, and I, I really admire her and respect her because, uh, you know, she 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 come up the hard way. You know, she paid a lot of dues, too. She's been out here on the indie scene for a while, and then she's been with some of the small, you know, operations and, you know, co smaller companies and stuff. But, you know, she's still on the grind, man, still trying to get there. So my thing for her is, you know, I hope somebody realizes that there's somebody, there's a woman out there with a lot of talent and there's somebody out there that can help them to draw some money. And I think that she can do that. So hopefully uh, AEW uh, uh, WWE or somebody, you know, give her the opportunity to give her a chance. What are your thoughts on Ahmed Johnson, who were, was given a huge push in WWE, then he went to WCW, seemed to pack on about, 100 pounds, and he kind of just faded away. I've seen some pictures of him lately. He looks like he got maybe even close to viscera size now. Well, you know, I didn't didn't really know him. I think when I first when I first got there, I don't know whether he might have even still been been there or not. You know, uh, like I said, I know Bradshaw and Ron. They they had the opportunity to work with him. You know, and by me riding with them, you know, I used to hear a lot of stories about them, but. Like I said, uh, he had a great opportunity as far as I know. You know, he got a great, great run. And then I did hear at one time that uh, Biz liked him and they wanted to put the world title on him. They, they wanted to make him world champion. So, uh, but I mean, I don't know what happened there. It may have been something he did. Uh, like I said, you just never know what goes on, you know. But only thing I can say about him is that, uh, you know, nobody had really nothing too much bad to say about him, you know, but they, you know, kind of had an ego, but, you know, who doesn't in, in this business? So, like I said, you know, good luck to him. And I, I, I did see a picture of him, too, and I saw that he had, you know, kind of put on a little bit of weight. So let's hope and pray for him and uh, hope he, you know, gets himself in shape and gets some of that weight off and, you know, kind of see about his health because, man, it ain't no joke out here now. Now, we, rem we all remember your match with Eric Bischoff at the Survivor Series 2005. How was it working with him overall? Well, it, it, <laughs> uh, I, you know what, man, I, to, to me, you know, I'm, I'm my worst critic, I guess, but I thought that was the worst shit. I'm telling you, I, I, I thought that was just horrible. Uh, I, and I thank God for Boogeyman. He came in at the end and he saved us, you know. And me, you know, not being a, a worker, you know what I mean, didn't, you know, have too much knowledge of really, you know, what I'm doing there. And, you know, maybe Bishop probably knew a little bit more than me, but I just thought that we were missing something there. It just didn't have the feel for me. So to me, I just thought it was bad. But, uh, you know, uh, Boogeyman saved us at the end. And uh, so, I, you know, I guess we got through it. But I, I just, I think that was just, that was just horrible. Now, Long Duck Dong tips $5 and is wondering if you ever considered wrestling instead of being a manager slash everything else you've done. I, I guess you probably didn't really have the build for for wrestling. Well, no, I, I never think about that part of it anyway, because, I mean, you know, when you're managing, you know what I mean? Sometimes you do have to wrestle. You know, back in the day, I got in six mans with Butch and Ron. I was part of the team. Uh, I was in single stuff there, me and Paul Ellerin, you know, uh, with the boxing glove wrestling there. And so, you know, I think 
from what I did then was enough for me. You know, I didn't want to be like full time bumping around like that. You know, like I said, to be in there, you know, bump around every now and then, that's not bad. You know, I can work with that. But to to be full time, I don't think I was built for that, man. My little bones, I'd probably been broke up a long time ago. So, uh, but anyway, you know, like I said, I didn't care what I had to do, whatever I was asked to do. That's what I did. It was, it was my job. And, uh, you know, that's, that's it. What was the worst, uh, fan attack situation you either had to witness or, or deal with directly in all your years in the business? What kind of attack you say? Fan attack, either a fan coming after you as a heel or a fan interfering in a match. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, I remember one time I was, uh, I was managing, I, I, I just butchered run. I was managing those guys and, uh, we was in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And, uh, that was this lady. We used to go to Montgomery all the time too, by the way, we was taping WCW. So it was an easy run down to Montgomery, hundred miles. So anyway, they had this lady that was there all the time and she had this snuff. She used to dip the snuff and she would always, you know, keep that cup of snuff and she'd get a few guys because we a few guys used to tell me, they used to say, man, you got to watch her. She'll get you. And she did get a few guys and brother, one night she didn't get me good, but she got me. I turned and there she was and she threw that cup and she'd been spitting it too. You know, she'd take, there was a, like a spit cup. She'd spit the snuff out in this cup and then she'd dash it on you. So she got it all over my clothes, man. You talking about something stinky, but that was, that was, that was, that was pretty wild, but she was dead serious. But uh, I haven't had too many fan reactions, you know, not, I've had people yell and cuss and, you know, say racial stuff, but other than that, that's about it. Now, I heard you say that Ice Train was one of the guys you liked managing the least. Why was he so difficult to deal with? Who was that? Uh, Ice Train, the WCW wrestler. Yeah, I, I didn't ever really uh, think he was difficult to deal with. I liked Ice Train. Me and him had a, had a, you know, had a you know, great uh, repertoire. We, we, were, we were okay. I enjoyed being with him. I, I think I strange just, you know what I mean? He wanted to do this. And then again, maybe I'm thinking maybe he didn't want to do this. So I, I believe he never really fully made his mind up that he wanted to do this full time. Uh, you know what I mean? I mean, he enjoyed himself while he was doing it. You know, I, to me, he had a great little run. But with me, he was never really difficult to work with. In fact, I talk to him now every now and then. And, uh, you know, I, I was involved at one time with a school here in uh, Atlanta face to face. And I straight had a chance to come by and talk to some of the students and uh, help them out. So, uh, yeah, with me, he was never difficult to work with. And last question here. Mamba wants to know if you have any Ming slash barbarian stories. Uh, both of those guys are very popular on this channel. No. Uh, oh, let's see. I think Barbarian, man. One time, I think we were in Baltimore, Maryland. I, that may have been the Jim Crockett Cup or it may have not. I'm not, I'm not sure what it was, but it might have been a pay-per-view. But anyway, it's a big show there. And uh, the, we was at this Days Inn, and uh, the Days Inn was like right across from the arena. And back then, you know, we everybody, you know, the boys like to drink and stuff. I was drinking everybody, so Barb, Barb was drinking, and so I think the bartender they wanted to cut him off. You know, you know, he drank, he drank enough. You know, you didn't need no more. So Barb didn't want to get be cut off. Barb wanted to drink more. So Barb kind of got a little pissed off about that. So Jimmy Valiant will tell you this story. I think Jimmy Valiant was on the elevator or something. I think Jimmy Valiant went to come off the elevator and I think Bob grabbed him and threw him back in the elevator. Then I think they saw Bob and got mad. So then they locked all the doors. They had these glass doors, they locked them. And then they called the police. And so it was like 10, I guess maybe 10 cops or something, but they all come and they're all trying to calm Barbarian down. You know, they're all trying to, you know, stop him. And so finally somebody went and they got his wife and uh, mama and his wife come down. She looked at Bob and she just slaps him and she grabs him and told, come on here. 
<laughs> and he walked right on in the elevator <laughs> and went right on upstairs. Yeah, we all, we've all heard the stories. He's afraid of her. Maybe you could just answer this one quickly because his band tip five dollars. Just any quick memory of Rise Owen the day after the accident? Who Rise Owen? Uh, you know when they did the Rise Owen special on Owen Hart the day after he passed away. Isban is asking uh, any memories of that that special uh, show. Uh, no, uh, the memories that I had, you know, I was I was there at the uh, Kemper Arena in Kansas City, and uh, I was right there when that happened. Uh, so that uh, that was the part that I had to remember. And let me tell you something, man. Owen was another great guy. What a great guy, you know, to, to be friends with, man. Always happy, you know, always just, I mean, I never saw him mad, never, not me, never have, but I just enjoyed being around him. So I was there the day that that happened and uh, trying to continue that show, you know, with all that going on, it was just, you know, it was un 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 unbelievable, man. Yeah, probably one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult days of your career, maybe along with that draws. Um, where yes. can people follow you if they want to look you up on social media? Uh, well, I'm, uh, let me see, I'm at teddylong.com, uh, and then I'm at, at teddyplayerlong on Twitter and teddylong.com on Facebook, and uh, that's where I'm at. <laughs> and they can... Uh, we're getting ready to uh, launch something, too, uh, Dave, uh, Devin. I'm uh, going to start a podcast along with uh, my man, D I'm sure you know DJ Tony Snow. Uh, we're going to get something started. It's going to be the DJ Tony Snow and Teddy Long podcast, and it's going to be called Hold On A Minute Player. So we're trying to get that off the ground, but uh, anybody can follow me at uh, teddylong.com and at Teddy Play Along on Twitter. And I'm on Instagram, too. That's great, and I think we might have to have you back again in the future because – we only got through about 20% of the questions today. So thank you well, very we, much. Uh, well, thank you very much, man, for having me. And, uh, you know, like I said, man, uh, it's been great and uh, to be a part of your, your show. And uh, anytime you need me, man, you know, just let me know and I'll be happy to come on. Thank you again. Thank you very much. And for all the people that we didn't get a chance to uh, talk to or didn't get a chance to answer your questions, or that, uh, maybe we can do it you know, on the next show and uh, all you people that I did talk to, just keep on being tuned in to Devin Hannibal and uh, the man is the man. And last thing, I'll, I'll just ask you a question, a personal one. Okay. If, if uh, Nick Aldis gave me a shot at that NWA title on one of these uh, United Wrestling Network pay-per-views, I mean, I know you probably haven't seen me wrestle but I'm telling you, I could beat this guy. I could take that title. Do you think I would have a chance of beating Nick Aldis if I had that opportunity? Well, you know, well, you know, I might just, I might just be the guy to give you the opportunity. Remember, you know, SW Fury is, is the, is, is the next best thing player, and to have a man, you know, like you, be a part of that, I think that would be a great idea, and that's something that I might talk over with the, with the big bosses and see if we can make that happen. Well, thanks a lot. Really appreciate all your time and, and the great stories. I'll let you uh, wrap this up however you want to wrap this up with the fans. Hey, man, uh, I just, like I said, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. It's uh, glad to be able to talk to you guys. And like I said, if you want to keep up with Teddy Long, you can, uh, I'm general manager for SWE Fury. Uh, you can pull us up on YouTube, but they're on the uh, Title Match Network, uh, also Fight TV uh, on the CW Network in the U.S., but uh, like I said, it's SWE Fury. You know, a lot of great things happen right there. Uh, big show coming up next week. Boogeyman will definitely be in the house. And so, uh, like I said, look for me coming soon to back again on the Devin Hannibal show. I'll be back here, players. So thank you all.